Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we're very excited for uh, this afternoon's presentation. And uh, we know that Zoom fatigue is, is real, so we are very grateful for your interest and uh, participation today for this webinar. My name is Duncan Robinson. I'm a philanthropy director with the Swedish Foundation. Uh, the foundation is a fundraising arm for Swedish. Uh, and if you're not familiar, Swedish is a, a large nonprofit healthcare system, uh, Washington State, based right here uh, in Seattle. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our donors who are joining us today. Uh, your support directly impacts patient care every single day, and we are so grateful for that ongoing support. I hope you all are as excited as I am uh, to hear from Dr. Pashardi today. Uh, she will be sharing her vision for guiding children and families to a healthier future. And uh, at the end, we'll have some time to ask some questions of Dr. Pashardi. So please uh, take some time to put some questions and thoughts in the Q&A. Uh, this event is meant to be informative, interactive, and uh, we look forward to hearing your feedback. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Pashardi. Uh, Uma is a pediatric gastroenterologist here at Swedish. She's been at Swedish for about 13 years, and I have had the pleasure of working with her for the past three or four. Um, as you will find out if you don't already know her, she is uh, an absolute dynamo, full of energy and passion for this work. Uh, we are incredibly lucky to have her, uh, not only here at Swedish, but serving our region and our community. Um, she's got a tremendous mind for medicine, science, and patient care specifically. Um, uh, that contagious passion that I, that I uh, referenced. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a chance to give her uh, a platform to talk about her incredible vision for taking care uh, of our children. Dr. Pashardi, welcome. We'd love to hear about your journey and, uh, and how you came to pediatric gastroenterology. And uh, as we know that the rate of childhood obesity uh, has more than tripled and tell us about your vision for guiding children and families to a healthier future. Thank you, thank you. It's. Um really a heartfelt gratitude that I have towards the foundation and Swedish, of course. Um, thank you, Duncan and to Shiloh and Nicole and David, Molly, everybody that's been just a tremendous help. And I'm really, really excited to talk to you about my passionate program here today. Um, and thanks to Swedish for hosting this event. So uh, as Duncan mentioned, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. I'm into my 13th year here at Swedish. And I'm going to talk to you about a uh, topic very dear and near to my heart, pediatric metabolic health, and hopefully be able to convince you to care as much about this as I do. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So to give you a little bit background maybe as to why I care so much about this, I became a pediatrician because I love kids. I mean, for me, it was, either pediatrics, I was going to become a teacher. I love kids, and that's why I became a pediatrician. And then I chose the subspecialty within pediatrics of gastroenterology because nutrition was very appealing to me. I actually did my medical school training back in India, and I was influenced by a lot of the famine and undernutrition, poor nutrition, malnutrition that I saw. And within pediatrics, the subspecialty that delves mostly into nutritional aspects of health is gastroenterology. So that's how I became a pediatric gastroenterologist, because of a passionate interest in nutrition. And I feel like my career has come full circle now, because here I am living in the United States of America, the land of abundance and all this opportunity. And I've gone from treating sort of undernutrition of one sort to undernutrition of another sort. And it's ironic in a sense that right now the World Health Organization statistics tells us that we still have 800 million starving people in the world. At the same time, we have nearly the same amount of people dying of preventable diseases because of access to poor nutrition that's leading to overweight and obesity. In fact, the World Health Organization now says that the that now most of the world's population lives in countries where overweight and obesity kills more than you know uh, being underweight or famished and so that just sort of hits it home for me that we have a whole entirely new type of malnutrition that is killing not only our adults but our children so again just to hit this point home because this is where that this is what makes me passionate about this is but because since 1980 the obesity rate has doubled in 73 countries and increased at least increased in 113 others and in all that time no nation not a single one has been able to reduce that obesity rate 
not one. And since the 1970s, so I was born in 1972. So in my own lifetime, since the 1970s, the obesity rate has tripled in the United States alone. So obesity is the real global pandemic. This is the pandemic of the century. This is a slide that I actually put together before the current COVID pandemic. And it just put in perspective for me what, what a threat obesity is to our world health. And so it has far exceeded the health concerns we've seen from global warming or the bird flu. In fact, it has now overtaken even smoking as uh, the number one cause of preventable life years lost. The World Health Organization again says that currently one fourth of the world's population, that's nearly 2 billion people are overweight and half of those are obese. This includes nearly 50 million children and not just children, but children under the age of five. So we are seeing obesity hit countries in Africa, in underdeveloped parts of Asia, and we have nearly 50 million children under the age of five in the world today that are considered either overweight or obese. So obesity is the global pandemic epidemic of the century, and there's no vaccine. Diet is the leading cause of death in the United States. It is responsible for more, more fatalities than we see from gun violence and car accidents combined. In fact, diet-driven diseases are now the number one cause of preventable life years lost. As I said, it's overtaken smoking. And 30 years ago, so I'm 40, I will be 49 very soon, 30 years ago, so within my lifespan, we went from having no children with type two diabetes I don't, I don't remember having a friend or a classmate or anyone in my school having diabetes, let alone type 2 diabetes, to now fast forward to 2021, one in four children, U.S. teens that is, are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And why has this happened? Because of us, largely in part, it's the medical professionals. We, institutions of public health, have become so obsessed with body weight, and what we look like on the outside and that number on the scale that we have completely overlooked what is really killing us. In fact, if we compare how many calories, the quantity of food that United States citizens or Americans consume today compared to 2003, it's actually less. So it's not about how much or the quantity or the calories, it's not how much we're eating, it is what we are eating. And I tell this to children that I meet every day, your body, your GN, DNA, your genetics aren't different from, you know, your bodies 50 years ago. They're the children that were alive 50 years ago. Our genes haven't changed. Our human bodies haven't changed. But our food industry has changed. What we eat has changed. And food talks to our genes. And that is what's causing the number one cause of preventable deaths in this day and age. So we need to go back to the basics and dispel all these myths because that's how we got into this mess in the first place. Everything we know about obesity is wrong. It's not about BMI, it's not about weight, it's not the number on the scale, it's not about counting calories, it's not about calories in and calories out, and energy balance, it's not about dieting and it's not about exercise. It's about the biochemistry of what the things that are added to our food are doing in, internally to our organs, it's about the quality of the food. And ultimately, that leads to something which is the cause of death, which is something we term metabolic syndrome, which is what I'm going to talk to you about in this talk. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions, including the visceral obesity, which is weight around the organs in the mid part of our body, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, high triglycerides, and low HDL. And I will talk to you about this in, in great detail. But basically, why do we have metabolic syndrome today? It's because foods that are high in sugar, low in fiber, injected with additives and chemicals now, can, now make up more than 60% of what we're putting in our mouths and calling food and feeding ourselves with. And so it's not so much about how much, but what's in that food and what's been done to that food that is killing us today. So obesity, that's the confusion. What's obesity versus what's metabolic syndrome? So obesity, at least defined by the World Health Organization, makes sense to me because it's abnormal or excessive fat accumulation 
but it's that type of accumulation of fat that specifically presents a risk to our health. And why would it pose a risk to our health? Because it's directly causing metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome, again, just to hit home the basic definition points, what is metabolic syndrome? It's a cluster of conditions that directly leads to early death. And this death happens from heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. These are the major causes of death today. This is 75% of preventable disease. This is where 75% of our healthcare costs go to. This is metabolic syndrome, defined as a cluster, any or all of these four factors, increased waist circumference, high blood pressure, abnormal blood lipid levels, and insulin resistance. Most of these things are um, hard to detect, except for the increase in your waist circumference. Many of these things you know, are missed. And that's what we as medical professionals need to be more cognizant of. And so this really is sort of a silent killer. So this is the state of the United States right now. When you look at the CDC data, um, in any adult over the age of 20, this is the statistics, one in three are considered to have a normal weight, only one in three. So the vast majority, seven out of 10, 70% of adults living in the United States today are either overweight, obese, or severely obese. And this is based on BMI. But that is not the problem again, because this metabolic syndrome, METS, as I've abbreviated it, MET syndrome is what's killing us. And MET syndrome overlaps with both the normal weight and the abnormal weight population. So actually, if you take about 40% of the normal weight population, they too have metabolic syndrome. And there's this sliver about 20% of the overweight, obese, and severely obese adults in the United States who actually are healthy. They don't even have metabolic syndrome. So instead of focusing again on weight, what we need to do is worry about metabolic syndrome, which unfortunately currently afflicts one in three adults in the United States. And globally, according to the World Health Organization, it's one in four. So again, just hitting it home hard, obesity is not the problem. Let's stop worrying about obesity. And this is another way to look at it. Obesity is increasing at about 2% per year. And this is data that was published in the Lancet, which is a you know, world-renowned peer-reviewed British medical journal. But diabetes is increasing by 4% per year, so almost the double. So if it was all about obesity, we'd be seeing obesity and diabetes you know, going hand in hand. We're seeing diabetes going up almost by double the rate at which obesity is rising. And remember that 90 to 95% of world diabetes is type two now. So type one is you know, five to 10% of world diabetes. The vast majority of people with diabetes have type two, which is metabolic syndrome. And that is really going up you know, rampantly higher more than just obesity. So it is not about obesity, it's about metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome, defining it once more for you, MET syndrome is organ damage from insulin resistance and fat accumulation in the viscera or the organs, and especially the organ, which is my specialty, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, the liver, and that's how I got interested in this field. So metabolic syndrome, again, cluster of any or all of four factors, and that specifically increases your chance of dying early waist circumference, abnormal blood li lipid levels, high blood pressure, and insulin resistance. And you know, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, as a pediatrician, to think that children could have die early from this, you know, it really breaks my heart. It's the organ damage that occurs because of insulin resistance and fat accumulation in the organ, specifically the liver, which is what led me to treat, treating this problem. Okay, next slide. I'm going to advance here and hopefully Zoom doesn't crash on me again. So what happens inside the organs? That's what I need to show you. And so this is an MRI scan of a body. And um, if you're looking at a person sort of facing you, that's what I want to walk you through in this scan. So look at the um, middle. This is the spine. I'm just going to sort of organize everything for frame of reference for you. So that is the spine in the middle of the body. You'll see at the top, those are the collarbones or the clavicles in green. 
These are the lungs, those sort of spongy gray looking things on either side in the chest, those are the lungs. These are the kidneys in blue and they sit right under this yellow thing I've highlighted in yellow, which goes across the body from the right to the left, the liver and look at the color of the liver, it's black. And then compare that to the color of muscle, similar sort of blackish color. And then lastly, this sort of light blue color is the subcutaneous fat. So look at that color difference between the black in the liver or black in the muscle and that gray look of fat. And that's what we need to look at when we look at these next three scans. So this is on the left, that scan that you just looked at with the spine in the middle, the liver and black cross and that gray tissue under the skin, which is the subcutaneous fat. This is the MRI scan of someone who, if we were to see them on the outside, would look kind of chubby to us. Um, you know, they probably have a body shape like mine, big butt, big thighs. Um, they have love handles around their, you know, midsection to a certain degree. But I hope that the inside of my body looks like this person's because the liver is very dark. There's not much or even a trace of liver fat. And so this is what we call a metabolically healthy but obese person. The medical term for this is MHO, metabolically healthy obese. And you can see that when normal livers have about less than 5% fat, this person, even though obese to us on the outside, has very, very little liver fat. Take this in comparison to the middle MRI. Again, spine in the middle, kidneys down here. This is the liver. You can see that the liver is gray. It's almost the same color as the fat under the skin or the subcutaneous fat. This is a fat person, as we would call them based on their external appearances. They have that love handles and you know we can squeeze more than an inch, but they have 24% of their liver also now with fat. So they are not only obese, but they are metabolically sick. They also have metabolic syndrome. And then look at the picture of the MRI on the right. This is a person actually, if we were to look at from the outside would look quite thin to us. They barely have any subcutaneous fat, but look at how much fat is in their liver. So their liver is full of fat. In fact, this person has just about as much fat as the person on the middle, but they, we would never know it looking at them on the outside. And this is another term we use in medicine called TOFI, T-O-F-I, which is thin on the outside, but fat on the inside. So what this is basically telling us is that we need to stop worrying about what we look like on the outside. Don't rely on this BMI anymore because up to 50% of women and 20% of men with a normal BMI are actually metabolically sick. They have increased visceral organ and or liver fat. And so you now we as a medical society need to stop worrying about this problem, the obesity. What we need to worry about is what's happening on the in, inside of their organs. You know, I would rather be fat and fit than thin and sick. And it's so common that when we see someone who's fat or obese, we, we tell them, oh, you need to lose weight. And if we see a skinny person, we tell them, oh, keep up the good work because you must be healthy. And what we need to remember is that people don't die of obesity. People die of what happens inside their organs. They die of liver diseases. And obesity is often just a marker and not always, but it can just be a marker of maybe the problem that's actually happening inside the body organs. So now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and I sort of explained you know, what, what is happening, why we have got into this mess. It's because we confused obesity with something that it's not and it's actually about metabolic syndrome. Now I'm gonna sort of shift gears and explain to you how this happened. And this, is, this goes down to the science in the brain. So why is it that sometimes we're hungry? Well, it's because our blood glucose might be following, falling a little bit. So we have something in our, inside of our brains, the hypothalamus that has both a satiety center and a hunger center. And it's bathed in a rich network of blood vessels. And these blood vessels are constantly giving our hypothalamus little micromolecular changes or shifts in the blood glucose. And the minute our blood glucose is even a tiny bit shifting downwards, we get a powerful signal to eat because our brain wouldn't survive without constant blood sugar going to it. So when we get that signal to eat, what then happens 
is that we consume nutrition or calories. And once we have consumed enough nutrition that we now start to store some of that energy. So now we're starting to fill a few fat cells. A hormone is released from fat cells, from adipose tissue. And this is a hormone you may have heard of. It's called leptin. And leptin is basically the satiety signal that goes back to our hypothalamus, that feeding and satiety center in the brain. And once the brain recognizes this, this signal coming back to it from the fat cell that has now released leptin, it realizes we've fed, we've fed enough, and we should now stop eating. This is what normally should happen in all of us. The problem is we now don't have that normal physiology because we have high insulin levels. And I'll explain to you why that is. But what happens when our insulin levels are actually high, when our pancreas is constantly pushing out a too much insulin, insulin, it just so happens, blocks leptin. And there it is, 101. This is metabolic syndrome. If you, not, if you remember nothing else from this, it's leptin resistance defines metabolic syndrome. So when you have a high fasting baseline insulin level, it beats leptin to that hypothalamus. It blocks leptin signaling. You never get the satiety signal. You're eating, you're forming fat cells. You don't even realize it. You constantly think you're starving. You continue to eat and the cycle just repeats itself. And so why do we now live in this state of hyperinsulinemia? 75% to 80% of obesity metabolic syndrome is due to that one factor alone, hyperinsulinemia. And we now know that the average adolescent and adult, and this is regardless of weight, today releases two, possibly more than two times the insulin today compared to what they were doing 40 years ago. Why is that? Well, the biggest factor is the food. 74% um, of packaged foods today contain added sugar. And so when it comes down to what's in the food, the primary driver for that high insulin level is sugar and greater sugar availability in and of itself accounts for at least one in four of the world's diabetes epidemic, so 25%. And that along with the fact that serving sizes have tripled since the 1950s. So we have more of these foods, we eat more of them and they're sugar laden and that drives up our insulin levels. I know I've gone through a lot and especially because of the <laughs> technical glitch, if I'm going a little fast or you have questions, that is what you know the QA box is for. And so I will be happy if there's time left over to answer any of these questions. So again, we have hyperinsulinemia largely in, due to the fact that we have uh, an influx of sugar added to most of our packaged and processed foods. So hiding sugar is actually hiding in 74% of foods that we buy in a store that come in a package. And I say hiding on purpose, because if they would just call it out for what it is, we wouldn't be duped by them. But these 10 or 11 international food companies literally hide the sugar that they put in our kids' foods. In fact, they have at least 56 names for sugar. They wouldn't have to make up 56 names for sugar if they just would you know, transparently call it sugar. And I, I can't tell you how many things have sugar that have no business having sugar. And a great example came the other day. So my husband works at Swedish and we were in the cafeteria and we picked up a packet of salt and it's right here. Um, and I am so suspicious now of everything that I put in my mouth and sugar in the food industry and causing this disease and the children that I take care of that, you know, I won't even take a packet of sugar and, and add it to my food without turning it around. And when you turn it around, you can see this thing called dextrose in a, in a salt packet, sorry, salt packet, um, and dextrose is a synonym for sugar. So a salt packet has sugar added to it. So we, if we can't trust the salt that we're eating, how can we trust anything else that the food industry is giving to us? Um, and so why does the food industry add so much sugar to the foods that we're eating? Well, it's simple. They know it's addictive. And so that comes back to what happens in our brain in terms of other hormones, one of which is dopamine. And so again, if you had a normal insulin level, this would take care of itself. So normally when you eat and you get some pleasure from the dopamine that's released, because that's the pleasure hormone, leptin and insulin actually wipe away that dopamine. So the pleasure goes away. You don't get as much pleasure from the food. You feel the satiety signal from the leptin in the brain and you stop eating. But what happens, remember the key to metabolic syndrome is hyperinsulinemia that blocks leptin. So you're leptin resistant because you're insulin resistant. So what happens when you're insulin resistant and you're leptin resistant, now you don't get the satiety signal. You have a, 
you don't have clearance of dopamine. So you're constantly feeling pleasure from food. You can't stop eating. So this, the, if you understand it from this sort of biochemical, um, you know, physiology 101, we, we won't be blaming the children for eating too much. This is the way they're hardwired. We're hardwired to get up in the morning because of dopamine. We, we rely on pleasure. We rely on doing things for pleasure. That's how we live day to day. And so if you know, sugar is eight times as addictive as cocaine, then the food industry is adding the sugar to the foods on purpose because they want us addicted and buying more. They care about their profits, not our health. So they created this disease. I always tell the kids that I take care of, this disease, this disease did not exist when I was a child. It exists today because of the food industry. And because we as medical professionals missed it, we, we were so focused on diet and calories and energy and calories and you know, weight that we missed this, it, it, it escaped our knowledge. So thinking back to how I, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, am now taking care of this, this is how it started for me. So um, in the early 1980s, when I was still a child, um, there had never been a child described with this until about 1982. So lo and behold, the first child gets described with this liver condition that the medical professionals had previously only seen in an alcoholic. Someone with chronic alcoholism was getting this liver disease that we now first described in a child. And this liver disease now, fast forward to 2021, is the most common chronic liver disease in the world. So in my lifespan, we go from having never seen this disease and to now this is the most common chronic liver disease in children and in adults. It's the most common cause of um, liver transplant and it's it succeeded even hepatitis C now. Um, so it's doubled in the last two decades alone and this occurred in my lifetime. I had never heard of this actually when I was a medical student or even a resident. And I remember being in the second year of my fellowship starting to take care of this disease and we really didn't know what caused it. And, and just to explain to you here, so here's a picture of the healthy liver compared to a fatty liver when fat has taken over um, significant amount of the healthy liver, then the liver cells basically don't work. And the end result is basically what we would think of as foie gras. It's, too much fat in the liver. So, you know, thinking back to when this was first described in the 1980s and 1990s, and even me as a resident not having heard of this, we were confused. Well, children aren't becoming alcoholics, obviously. But why are they getting this mystery liver condition that we previously only saw in chronic alcoholics? And now we know um, it's sugar. So it turns out that the liver processes sugar specifically fructose, by the exact same biochemical processes as alcohol. And that's because sugar, which is a combination of two molecules, one is fructose and one is glucose, that fructose moiety is metabolized literally by the same biochemical processes as alcohol. And so if you get a lot of sugar in your diet, and the white stuff sugar has got fructose in it, you are going to get the same disease as people who've been drinking alcohol their whole lives. And so specifically when sugar is not bound to fiber, which is why people ask me all the time, and I just wanna clarify, eating fruit is fine because fruit has fiber in it. If not inherently bound to fiber, fructose will, get ex will basically get, um, if not inherently bound to fiber, fructose will go to the liver and cause the same uh, toxic damages to the liver as alcohol will. So we need um, to explain this to the children. We need to understand this as medical professionals, and then we can start to reverse this liver disease. So the upper limit of sugar that a normal healthy liver can metabolize in 24 hours, it's kind of easy to remember in 24 grams is 24 hours. And that's roughly six teaspoons because we say about a, a, a teaspoon of sugar has about four grams of sugar in it. Um, so if we look at what's actually happening in society now, people are on average taking three to four times that much sugar. And it's quite easy to do. You know, I, I meet people every day who think they're taking a fruit smoothie and that that's good for them. But remember when the fruit is smoothied or put in a blender, you've destroyed the fiber and it was the fiber that protected the liver from that damage of the fructose. Um, it's as simple as getting one of these um, Chick-fil-A Greek yogurt, yogurt parfaits, which will exceed your daily intake of sugar. 
Um, children right now are on average getting 15 teaspoons of sugar. And remember, we were saying that a healthy liver can only take six teaspoons. So when I meet a patient that's already having this liver disease, we have to cut back drastically on their sugar content, sugar consumption. So this is how I you know, started taking care of this disease because I was introduced to this disease, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as a pediatric gastroenterology fellow. And at that time, we really didn't know what caused it. We would do all these tests and liver biopsies on these children, wondering why they had this liver disease. And it's really only in the last 10 to 20 years that we've come to understand it's specifically fructose that causes this condition. And so this is my mission. This is why I'm passionate about this, because I would like to help children, first of all, never get this condition in the first place. But even if we can detect it, to be able to fix it before it gets to the irreversible uh, stages, which is possible and doable. And we are doing it here in our clinic at Swedish every day. So again, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the disease that got me interested in this is basically going to lead to insulin resistance. And you're going to get a child who has the same disease as a chronic alcoholic, but without any alcohol exposure, it's their sugar exposure. And they're gonna get the same liver disease that a chronic alcohol would get with the associated risks and complications. And this is why we look at the visceral adiposity or the abdominal circumference as one of the hallmarks of this condition starting. Um, usually when I talk about this to patients, the next question is, you know, well, I'm gonna take the sugar out, so can I have all the diet soda or the sugar free alternatives? And my quick answer would be no. Um, and the reason is, you know, First of all, nobody's gonna be able to study this over 50 years, the effects of the various sugar alternatives. But what we do know is that there is going to be an intense sugar taste to the tongue. In fact, some of these sweeteners are almost 70 times as sweet on the tongue as regular sugar. That is also gonna affect insulin re release. Plus we, we don't know the full um, microbiome effects that these sugar, these artificial sweeteners would have. They also are addictive. So I myself, when I was starting to learn all this, thought I would just take sugar out of my diet because I didn't want to have natural tea and I would chew sugar-free gum all the time and have sugar-free beverages. And I couldn't break my sugar addiction. I was one of those sugar holics myself. And it was until it wasn't until I basically stopped my own um, addiction to all these sugar-free products that I was able to break my own addiction. So I, you know, we, we don't recommend sugar-free alternatives either. And in today's day and age, the amount of exposure our kids are getting to sugar and sugar alternatives just in their vitamins and supplements and beverages, it's, it's crazy. And the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry were all at fault. Um, so I've sort of explained how I got here. And another piece of this puzzle is because I, I'm a gastroenterologist, I also see children who have hidden metabolic syndrome coming in the disguise of other sort of gastrointestinal problems to me. So this is a child who was referred to me and I saw last month, a 17 year old girl who was referred actually because she felt very constipated and nauseous all the time. And in the note that the primary care physician and other pediatrician sent to me was that I don't know what's wrong with this girl. You know, she's constipated, she's all, all the time nauseated. And I've checked her labs and they're pretty normal. So I checked her total cholesterol, I checked her hemoglobin A1C, they seem normal to me. What should I do? When should I repeat labs? Is there anything else to be done? And he specifically looked at the liver numbers and he thought that they weren't too bad. They were only in the hundreds. And if you look at normal labs here, um, ALT, which is that liver enzyme test he did, actually normal for a girl is less than 25. So for some reason, we as medical professionals think hundreds is kind of normal. So when I see this child, because I know what I know now from years of this experience, I look at that growth curve and I have the answer sitting there right in front of me. This is a girl who, when she was a toddler entering school age, was relatively petite. You can see her growth, this is her weight and percentile comparing her to other girls her age. And she's rather petite. She's at about the 10th or 15th percentile weight for age. And then as she grows up, and here she is 17 years old, 
her weight percentile has just steadily climbed and climbed and climbed and now is actually in that overweight obese category. Um, and so there I can see that trend. Nobody gains weight like that unless their insulin is starting to go up. And so what I checked her labs in June 2021, I could see that her triglyceride HDL ratio was elevated. I don't care about her total cholesterol, which is what the pediatrician had looked at. I looked at her tri high triglyceride HDL ratio, which is the marker for metabolic syndrome. And normal is one or less than one. Hers is eight. And I looked at her ALT, again, less than 25 is normal for a girl. Hers is 209. So she has fatty liver disease. And I also checked her fasting insulin, was, which was you know, not surprisingly elevated. So even without the labs, though, I could see that insulin was at play here. And even in the labs that had been sent to me from the pediatrician, we could see that something was up with the insulin. So how do we reverse this? What's the fix? We have to change the biochemistry. We have to change the environment. We have to change the types of food, the access to the food, the stress, the sleep, because these all affect our insulin levels. Once we're able to lower that insulin level, then, then only can we fix the leptin resistance. And as I mentioned before, the key to metabolic syndrome is fixing that leptin resistance. So that is why we set up this program. We've named it resilience because in my mind, when I think about what I'm doing for kids, I'm trying to prevent, I'm trying to treat, and I'm trying to reverse what diet and lifestyle driven diseases have occurred in children. So this isn't necessarily all about metabolic syndrome. It's also about their physical symptoms. They come to me with nausea, they come to me with belly pain, they come to me with constipation, and we can reverse and fix all of that by teaching them resounding, you know, good, powerful messages about diet and lifestyle. And so we've named our clinic the Resilience Clinic, and our motto is sort of where we doctors, nurses, dietitians are going to teach families and children how food is the best medicine. It's the, it's the dose that we take multiple times per day. We can use our kitchen as the clinic, and we will show you how to get out of this problem. We will be your cooks. We will show you how to be a cook, and that is the best medicine for your health. And so what our vision is for this program is to have um, sort of a multi-pronged approach. We will have our traditional office visits. Um, we want to have a constant you know, reiteration of the same message, but from different people giving the message. So we will have a gastroenterologist, which is me meeting with these patients. Then that will be followed up by a trained health coach who is also a gastroenterology nurse calling them or doing a Zoom chat within two weeks of the physician visit, enforcing the message and helping them you know, move on to the next step. Then they will meet with the dietitian. Then they will get another call from the health coach. Then they will meet with an endocrinologist. We'd also like to have a behavioral health specialist a psychologist as part of this piece. And then we will have another health coach visit. And this will all sort of be navigated by a, a gastroenterology nurse that we have here in the pediatric subspecialty clinic. But that's just one piece of the puzzle. We will also have hopefully a very large online um, piece to this program because you know there will be children who can't travel to see us or can't make all of the visits. And we want to help children all over our community, if not the world, be able to reverse and you know, treat their metabolic syndrome. So we will have a heavy online resource. We will hope to have a web page and social media. You know, it, we need to be sending the message. We can't let the food industry you know, give us their food propaganda anymore. We need to take charge of this message. We also hope to teach primary care pediatricians so that they can, you know, find this detected and treat it earlier, maybe before they need a subspecialist like myself. Nothing would actually make me happier in, in truth than for just like this becoming a new disease that happened in my life, to be able to be, say that in my lifetime, or maybe the next generation's lifetime, this is an eradicated disease because we're able to prevent it from happening in the first place. And so pediatricians would love to know more about this. Um, and so we will have regular medical education conferences for the primary care doctors so that they don't have to refer to a clinic like us. And then we hope to take these children and their families on expeditions to food stores and show them how to read food labels, teach them how to cook. We will actually have regular you know, teaching cooking classes to them. And we hope to live stream and share those on our online webpage and social media handles. 
So I think what resilience is really meant to do is to take it from not only treating one child at a time in the clinic, as we do already, we've been doing this for about five years, but with the help of the foundation and Swedish and all of you, what we're hoping to do is take it one step further. So we can treat one kid at a time here in the clinic, or we can help more children sort of at a you know, systemic community-wide approach by having all of these other resources in place as well. Okay, I think I've definitely gone over my time, so I'm gonna just sort of leave it there. I think resilience is a great name for this because you showed tremendous resilience in the face of the Zoom glitch. Uh, Dr. Pichardi, thank you so much. That's uh, as, as many times as I've heard you speak about this, it doesn't uh, become any less relevant or any less inspiring, uh, especially to someone like myself who has a couple young kids at home. It's certainly changed you know, our behaviors around food. Um, I, I see that we do have a few uh, questions coming through the Q&A, so I think uh, I'd like to get to those right now. Um, Kathleen put in the chat, um, with perhaps 50% of normal sized women with metabolic syndrome, do we all need our livers scanned to diagnose fatty liver and metabolic syndrome? No, you don't need it. So you can definitely, you, you can be alerted to the fact that you may have metabolic syndrome just by reviewing what your dietary intake is. If, if, if you tend to have more packaged and processed foods, that's just sort of the most common tip off that you're at risk for it or you may already have it and measure that waist circumference. That's probably the best indicator without paying a lot of money or doing a lot of tests that you, you are probably on your way to having metabolic syndrome. No, we don't liver scan everybody. You know, I, like I said, with that clinical case, I can see it from the growth curve. I look at that child's overall body habitus. I look at their waist circumference and that tells me most of the picture. Wonderful. Uh, let's see another question here. Um, blending fruit and vegetables destroys the fiber? Correct. So yeah, there's two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble. I'm glo so glad somebody asked this question. <laughs> Soluble fiber will stay intact, even if you put fruit through a blender, but insoluble fiber is blended into smithereens. And so it's that combination of soluble and insoluble that actually protects our liver from the harm of sugar. So yeah, it's not good. It's what we say in the clinic here, eat your fruit, don't drink it. <laughs> Wonderful advice. Um, uh, in that same vein, as, uh, from the same woman, Amy, um, can adding a protein to a meal uh, that is high in added sugar help the fructose be excreted rather than processed by the liver. For example, eating an egg before eating a pancake with maple syrup. No, I'm sorry, it's not that simple. Um, sh sugar without fiber inherently bound to it risks that sugar going to the liver. I think your question may be speaking to glycemic load or how fast that insulin spikes. Yes, you know, if you eat foods that if, if I were to have like sh a sugary beverage on an empty stomach, that would probably be more harmful than having it in combination with some protein or fiber or fat in a meal. But does the protein itself bind to the sugar and protect the liver? It's not as simple as that, no. Uh, another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Is this program available for people out of state? I have family members who are not in Washington uh, and so uh, not in the Swedish network, then I know they would benefit from this information. So we're happy to see anyone. Um, and that is, but we know it's hard to travel here. And that is why more than what we've been doing in the clinic patient by patient, we want to be ha having the social media piece and the website and the Facebook lives. And I want to share what I do in the clinic with the world. And you don't have to necessarily travel here, but yes, we'll see everybody. Anybody can come and see me. I'm happy to see everybody. Can children be enrolled in the program directly by parents, or do you need a primary care provider reference? It, it really depends. You know, reach out to us and we're happy to work with you. We, we would love to see everybody who needs help. And so we really don't have any hard and fast rules about that. I, I can attest their clinic is wonderful to work with. So please uh, give that phone number a call if you have questions about getting connected. Um, let's see. Oh, Wolfram has a point here. <laughs> it might be worth mentioning that you hosted two highly successful education events uh, right. that sold out at Swedish. Maybe talk a little bit more about uh, some of the education. That yeah, so that's for providers. being asked 
by Wolfram, who actually <laughs> helped me put those two conferences together. So in 2017 and 2018, we put together, you know, two of the highly best rated conferences. They were two days, you know, summits, we called them for primary care doctors from across the um, the state and people came from as far as the United Kingdom to listen to some of the speakers we had on stage talk about metabolic syndrome. And that is the movement that was started back then and it's what we hope to continue. So we hope to repeat those year, year after year. Uh, this is a, a follow up on the, on the blending question. Uh, does this mean that juicing fresh fruits and veggies is not a good idea? So anything that has sugar in it we, we prefer you not to blenderize because it affects how it's absorbed and the glycemic load and the insulin in the liver. Green smoothies, because vegetables don't have sugar in them, aren't as harmful metabolically speaking. So I have no problem with the green smoothie. It's the fruit smoothies that are harmful. Wonderful. Um, question for, uh, for you about adult programs. So is there programs for folks that are you know, not, not children? Swedish has um, adult weight loss services. I'm not intimately involved in those. I'm a pediatrician, and so I'm really focused right now on child, treating children here in resilience specifically. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about gummy vitamins for kids? I don't think I could get my child to take a regular vitamin tablet. Right. So it's it's not the worst thing if you're if the you know little bit of sugar that your child has to eat is in the form of a gummy vitamin, but you, you we really don't need to think that that's the only answer. Food is a great bioavailable way to get your micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. So if a child is really having a a, a well balanced diet, maybe a vitamin supplement isn't even necessary. That's a great point. Uh, I'm loving seeing all these questions coming in. Very great, engaged audience here. This is great. Um, here's a question uh, about CGM devices. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about what that means, but this could be helpful for connecting dots between what kids eat and the glucose response. Are children allowed to use those devices? So, you know, I want to preface this by saying I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, and I've had to learn a lot out of my specialty about insulin and hormones um, because of I think the lack of training that I got in medical school. So I may not be the most well-equipped to answer this because CGM, continuous glucose monitoring is a system designed primarily for people with type one diabetes. And this is not a clinic for type one diabetes, but it is true when you eat certain foods that are spiking your you know, insulin or changing your blood glucose level. Yes, that would be notable if you were wearing a CGM. Uh, let's see, another question about programs for adults. You already answered that. Um, do you have plans for an in-person teaching kitchen? Uh, yes, I'm a family do. medical doc and would love to be involved. <laughs> oh, that's great. You know, yes, we, we plan to do this once a month on Sunday specifically because we have a teaching kitchen across the street and downtown parking in Seattle is expensive except on Sundays when it's free. So we hope to do once a month Sunday in-person cooking classes. Yes, that we will also live stream. Um, aside from fresh meat and veggies, what foods or drinks do you suggest consuming? So drinks, it's really easy. Water. <laughs> we Human beings were meant to eat food and drink water. We need water for hydration. Food, I love this, the question, because I forgot to say it during my talk. Jerf, that's my motto, J-E-R-F. Wolfram actually came up with this. Just eat real food. As much as possible, cook in your own kitchen, Learn the power of real food, minimal intake of processed packaged food. The food industry, let me make clear, the food industry caused a disease in children today that did not exist when I was a child. The first case of type two diabetes, the first case of NAFLD described in 1980s. This is a disease that the food industry caused that the medical professionals missed. We need to take our health back from the food industry and we need to learn to do better. Right, in that same vein, uh, many families feed their toddlers fruit squeeze packets, pouches, and juices, thinking they are healthy options. When are yeah. these sort of foods okay, or are they always bad, even for babies? So, you know, I don't ever want to say always <laughs> in general, but it, it is always better to do this without the food industry's help. As much as possible, 
we need to get our children to learn to eat real food, unadulterated, unprocessed, or minimally processed. If you're taking a food out of a pouch, turn it around, look at the ingredients. We would want it to have very basic ingredients, but remember when they're in pouches, the fiber is gone. Fiber is such a good you know, nutrient for our gut. So it's hard for me to think off the top of my head a beneficial situation for these. Um, but I'm, you know, the, every child is different and there's unique situations, which is what we do in our clinic every day. We talk to families and we, we work with them. There's nuances to medical care. So I don't want to make any blanket statements, but in general, when I see those things, I get worried. Yeah, I think speaking from my own experience, the benefit is mainly for the parent. I know that when my kids <laughs> screaming their head off, I, I reach for that pouch and that solves the problem usually. Right, so right. We, we've got to find a better way. Yeah. Um, here's a question that I can answer. Uh, will we have access to the slides or will the video be available for others to view? And yes, we are recording this and we will edit out our Zoom <laughs> snafu and it will look pretty. You'll never know it happened. Uh, so we'll send it out to all registrants and uh, make sure that you know it's on our website and everyone can have access to this if they want to, to see this information. Thank you. Uh, Lori discovered that her magnesium supplement has two grams of sugar. So. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I'm telling you, this salt packet, sugar. <clears throat> It's Hummus incredible. has sugar. Everything has sugar in it. Uh, she has another good follow-up question. Uh, how will you motivate busy parents to cook and purchase healthy foods? So I think the power of the science, the biochemistry, sitting down with them one-on-one, -on -one, um, talks like this, the one that I gave, I think when you understand what the food industry has done to poison our children, that they created a disease, that is probably the most empowering message that I can give to parents parents love their kids they would do they would die for their children and if you know that what you're about to serve to your child and children basically contains poison for their liver i can't see a parent walking away from that message is the resilience clinic doing a study to monitor the progress or success of the kids that come through your program would, that's definitely on my radar we would love to be able to look at before resilience and after resilience, the data on what happens. Are, we want to see our makeup community impact. And so, yes, we would love to join with um, partners and research on that. Uh, Kristen Shane put in a clarifying point. Our program is for kids, but involves the whole family. Correct. <laughs> and Chris, Kristen is that GI nurse who's now the certified health coach that will be helping the children in the clinic. She's an essential cog, absolutely. Um, would you rather have kids consume real sugar versus sugar substitute when sugar is in food, if you had to pick? Real sugar, because I am all about real food. I would rather avoid chemicals. And, and you know, 24 grams, so there isn't a safe amount. It's not like you have to live off of zero sugar. So if you're gonna have your 24 grams or six teaspoons, yeah, make it real food. You speak at schools. I know what is served in the cafeteria at my child's school, and I don't think they are getting the message as well. And busy parents often just sign up for the school lunches. I am happy to speak at schools. I've spoken at one school, the school of my niece, but part of this program, these Sunday classes that we're gonna have, we'll be doing cooking classes. We would love to take parents shopping. We would love to go to schools. We will do whatever it takes to get the community convinced that this is meaningful and we need to take our health back. Wolfram has another comment that they've identified 262 names for sugars and yeah. he has a link uh, to that information. If you yeah, because we got wise to the 56. So now they came up with 150 more. Yeah. <laughs> Food industry, man. He says it's virtually impossible for a parent to just read the labels to monitor sugar in their kids' diets. So when I knew there was 56, I would walk around with this little pocket card saying like, okay, I'm going to look at foods and go through the 56. It got so crazy. You can't do that. That's why they yeah. do this, the food industry. You just need to remember jerf. That's, sure. that's easier. Yeah. Just eat real food. All right. Uh, access to healthy foods can be difficult for some. How do you see um, SDOH factors such as access to healthy food impacting the program and addressing these factors uh, that can have an impact? So definitely a, a priority of our program. And, you know, we've been doing this for about five years in the clinic. And we, we are helping families from all socioeconomic class statuses. We teach we have patients who live out in the farm country in Eastern Washington, and I, it, it is doable. I think at a high level, we think it's harder than it is. We will, we will be able to work with each family. Wonderful. Um, do you have any concerns about canola or other processed oils? So 
you know, if it's heat, if it's processed under high heat, yes, that can actually make the oils rancid before we even get them. Um, and uh, much of canola oil specifically to that question is GMO. And so that is again, where the food industry has made a mess of what we're cooking with. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, looks like we have our last question. Oh, another one popped in. Have you considered partnering with Behavioral Health? It seems like a natural partnership given the impact on intake and mood. Any metrics? We would, we would love to have behavioral health yeah. support. So right now we have Kristen who went out on her own and got certified as a health coach. But part of our you know, hope with the foundation is to have an actual child psychologist be part of our team because eating and nutrition and it's all part of you know, how we feel about food and that sort of social dynamic is very important. Canadian government successfully updated their public food guide by blocking influence and lobbying from the food industry. Do you see that happening in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I don't want to get into politics, <laughs> but <laughs> no, I don't. I don't see it happening. Not in this day and age, no. Is anyone on your team working on advocacy and or political action? I know the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Dietetics uh, tries their best to address issues regarding nutrition, but they can only do so much. How do you feel political action would benefit? I, I'm not personally politically active. Um, I, I imagine that might become something we do. I think right now I'm just focused on treating children and educating and empowering you know, the community at large. But I think we have tremendous influence. Each of us has influence and as a community, as a healthcare system, our buying power has huge influence. If we refuse to buy this crap, <laughs> it won't be sold to us, hopefully. Yeah, I think that's what's exciting about this is, you know, there's a lot of these disparate pieces that have been happening across our healthcare system, but this is a chance where everything's together in one place, a comprehensive program that we're creating at the local level that serves the community that can serve as a model for the rest of our state, the rest of our country, the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's really exciting. And I, I would be remiss if I said that, you know, that this it wouldn't be possible without community support. So thanks to you donors who are in the audience who've been a part of this so far. If you feel compelled after hearing Dr. Pashardi speak uh, to take action, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, whether it's volunteering or making a gift or uh, taking your kid to the clinic, whatever it may be, um, we want to be engaged with you and, and partner together to make this vision a reality uh, so our children don't have to deal with this um, disease now and for the rest of their lives. Um, and I know that we're at a tremendous place right now with the clinic operating as it is and helping kids. Like you said, we're, we're pulling kids out of the river right now, but we need to focus more upstream and how we can build out a program that, that serves the community before this even becomes a problem. Um, is there anything you'd like to share uh, in closing, Dr. Pashardi? Um, no, just deepest apologies for the Zoom glitch. <laughs> <laughs> No worries whatsoever. Um, again, we appreciate both your time, Dr. Bashardi, and all of you uh, who have taken an hour out of the afternoon uh, to be with us. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. My information uh, is showing on the screen and uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email as well. We'd love to hear your responses uh, on the survey. We hope you enjoyed your time here. Um, please uh, keep us in your, in your thoughts and we'll keep you in our thoughts. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Take care.